I'm just going to lay out a few comments I hope to spark some debate. Um, because although I do spend much of my time looking at economic and financial issues, I was recently in Aspen at a small gathering organized by Charlie Rose, the US television um, chat show guru, if you like, um, with a veritable who's who of the American foreign, foreign policy and military establishment. I mean, everybody from Colin Powell, Donalyn Gates, Alexander Petraeus, John McCain, you name it, they were there in the room. Very small group. And we started off discussing the issue of revolutions. And when is it right to intervene or not intervene in support of revolutions if you are America? And the issue that sparked that was obviously the recent events in Syria. But what surprised me was the level of passion and to be frank, division that quickly erupted in the room. Essentially, a large number of the people there were arguing that actually the problem about revolutions is that they tend to end rather messily. In fact, one of them suggested the only revolution that had not ended very mess messily in the last few decades was the American Revolution, <laughs> displaying wonderful American self-confidence. Um, and we're essentially arguing that it'd be great folly to spend too much time getting involved in Syria because at the end of the day, America would end up being not just wasting resources, but essentially being humiliated on the world stage. The flip side of that were several voices who were arguing that it was imperative for America to get involved in supporting um, the right side in revolutions like the Syrian revolution, because if it didn't, it would quickly lose whatever moral authority it had, and its standing and status on the global stage would be significantly undermined. Now, such arguments um, in the very heart of the American leadership are not, of course, new. If you go back to the days of the founding fathers in America, there was an equally bitter fight about whether or not America should get involved with the French Revolution. Um, and in many ways, what the kind of language that's being banded around today in relation to Syria or elsewhere is uncannily similar. But what's fascinating is the degree to which you have an overlay between, or even if you like, a triple perfect storm of three factors that are combining to create these, to make these debates very, very highly charged. Because the question of America's standing in the world and its status and how it should or should not deal with potential new competitors with, like China is coming at a moment of tremendous um, fiscal pressure and also a tremendously bitter and deep um, intellectual and ideological de debate about what the role of government could or should be right now. The question of just how free market, just how big a government America wants is something which is very much bubbling through the political current. And the fact that those three elements are intersecting right now is one reason why the discussions are so bitter, so deep, and for the moment so hard to resolve. Um, one of the people who was in the room that day said, effectively summing up the, the fundamental problem, the biggest single security threat to America today comes not from Iran, not from anywhere else, but from two square miles around Washington. And that essentially is a big challenge that the American establishment are still grappling with and will be dealing with for a long time. So I say that as an overview to... Jenny, who's going to talk to us about what that means in the practice? I feel like I've been thrown a fiery ball that I now have to deal with. Um, but let me, let me indeed pick up um, some of the points that Julian just made. Uh, the question to me is intent versus reality. What's actually happening, happening and what's the intent uh, to the extent that you can kind of call a unitary intent on the part of the US government, which I think might be going a little far, but we're going to simplify a little bit here. The question that I kind of keep coming back to is America has for decades been talking about the fact that it does not want to be the world's policeman. But I think most people would agree that rhetoric and action haven't followed one another. It's said it doesn't want to be the world's policeman, and then it's gone and been the world's policeman, and it seems to be actually pretty happy with being the world's policeman. Um, and the question is, is that still the case? And I would argue that no, it isn't still the case. For the first time, perhaps, America's actions are following its rhetoric. Um, now we can debate, and I'm sure we will debate, whether that's planned, whether there is a policy to do that, whether it's well thought out, whether there's a big strategy. It's a good question, but the reality is that America's actions are following its rhetoric. It does not want to be the world's policeman. It doesn't say it wants to be the world's policeman, and it isn't. Um, and why? And this is really picking up many of the same points that Gillian said. Essentially, 
there's both domestic reasons for this and there's international reasons. On the international sense, the kind of broader framework, the broader context is, well, the challenges we face today are not ones that can be dealt with unilaterally or bilaterally. So if you go back, uh, many of the challenges, they were cross-border challenges, they were between you know, A and B, they covered a region. Today's challenges, you know, list the top five challenges that the world faces today and their environment, their energy, their pandemics, you know, their food and water security. These things do not have borders. America can't charge out and say, this is what we want to do and we're going to do it. It will have absolutely, it won't maybe not, no impact, but it'll have very, very little impact. So the first reason why is this happening is because the challenges we face do not lend themselves to a unilateral American response. Then there's a couple of domestic reasons, and this I won't elaborate on because Gillian kind of laid them out. There's, um, there's the fact that people on both sides of the aisle are now talking about this. This is not a Democratic or, a, or Republican thing. This is pervasive. You, you look at polls within the United States. There was a New York Times CBS News poll conducted in September of this year that found that 62% of respondents, American respondents, felt that the US should not take the leading role among all other countries in the world in trying to solve the, in, the international conflicts. That was true across the aisle. Democrats, Republicans, 62%. Um, more than half, polled by Gallup, um, proposed military action in Syria, opposed it. Less didn't. Um, so the public perception is saying, we don't want to do this anymore. Uh, the elite leaders are saying, we don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Things like the energy revolution that's taken place over the last couple of years, it actually shouldn't affect foreign policy in any significant way. America's still going to need to be engaged in the Middle East. And yet the perception is that it does. The perception is for many Americans that they no longer need to be engaged in the Middle East as they, want, as they once were. And then, of course, there's the resource factor, the fact that America, like so many other countries in the West, can no longer live by the social contract that we've had for the last 60 years. We just don't have the resource. To, something has to give. Uh, and so the question is, is it international, is it domestic? Almost certainly international. Um, what does this mean? And this is where I will close just to kind of put something out on the table. Uh, Hillary Clinton was here about ooh, six weeks ago now, and she put out a concept of networked leadership. Um, and networked leadership to her meant that it was an America that was more multilateral, and that an America that not only engaged with state actors, but non-state actors. Uh, the example she gave was, if you want to do something about cybersecurity, that is not something that the state can do alone. The state has to work with the, with the corporate sector to do it. Uh, she, now, whether that, and this gets back to where I started, whether that's an intentional policy of the Obama administration, I do not know. I can't answer that question. But it can, I can certainly say that that's kind of the reality, and that's where we're going. The world's problems are going to be dealt with by state and non-state players. She's right about cybersecurity. She's right about energy. She's right about the environment, um, pandemics. Um, and it's going to be the way that the state is used and the way that this administration, the Obama administration, and I believe the one that takes over from it, be it Republican or Democrat, will move to use much more soft power, much more diplomacy and economic power rather than necessarily military power. The way they use military power is changing. Uh, it's no longer mass. It's much more targeted. And again, I would say this is not an Obama phenomena. Um, the question I have is, if that is true of the United States, what is the international response? Is Europe going to step up and fill the vacuum that is a, a, a less active America, or an America that acts in a very different way, or not? Is China going to? Um, or do we have a vacuum? Do we just have to deal with that fact? Mm -hmm.